is Jed Levine. Yep. And uh, I am the now president emeritus and director of external relations at Caring Kind, the heart of Alzheimer's caregiving. Um, and it is a pleasure to, to moderate and, and host this meeting this evening uh, with the very, um, I think, distinguished and entertaining <laughs> speaker, uh, Stephen Post, and I'll tell you a little bit more about him as well. So is there anybody here uh, for whom um, uh, it's your first contact with Caring Kind? If it is, put your hand up in the either on the screen or a uh, couple of you. So let me just, just um, give you a little bit of background about who we are and what we do. Uh, before I do that, I wanted to just remind everybody that uh, the program is being um, recorded so that we can send it to other people who uh, who were not able to join us tonight. Um, and also, if we can keep you on mute, it'll, it'll keep the background noise down. If you have questions, and we're going to do, the format is we're going to be doing a, a brief presentation and then kind of a discussion and questions from you. Odessa, I see you have your hand up. Is there anything I can help you with before we get started? No, I guess. No, I'm sorry, you don't have your hand up. That was my- No, I don't, sorry about that. Okay, sorry, no, that was, that was me, that was me. It was my, my cursor looks like a hand. Um, anyway, so welcome. So Caring Kind provides, we are really New York's trusted partner for dementia care. We've been around for 40 years, more than 40 years actually. And all of our services are free of charge to individuals with the disease and their family uh, care partners or caregivers. We have a whole host of programs and helpline, over, I would say, 80 support groups for family caregivers, lots of education programs like this. And also we do more in-depth training programs and providing people with the skills in order to communicate and manage uh, the care for their relative and also very importantly, care for themselves. Um, we have a program called the Medical Alert Wanderers Safety Program, which everybody here, if you're a relative who is in, you know, um, memory impaired is not in that program. They should be, it's a bracelet identification program. So in case somebody goes wandering, they can be quickly identified by um, law enforcement and returned home safely. So, um, and all of this information you can find on your, um, on our website, which is www.caringkindnyc, all one word, dot org. There's lots of information there. And we also have a whole uh, where we, we restarted some of our programs for people with MCI, mild cognitive impairment, or early stage. So we now are offering something called cognitive stimulation therapy, um, which has been very popular. There are 12 sessions over six weeks. And then there's a maintenance portion of the program that goes on for another six to 10 weeks, I believe. And so again, if you want more information about those programs, the best place to get any information about Caring Kind is through our helpline. And that number is 646-744-2900. We do legal and financial planning seminars, seminars on Medicaid home care, how to access that, and um, many other kinds of programs. Many of our workshops are done in English, in Spanish, and in, um, Mandarin, and some in Cantonese as well. So there's lots of uh, opportunity for, for education and support. And we also provide professional education. We're doing, we do an understanding dementia for family caregivers, but we also do an understanding dementia for uh, professionals. And there will be one later on in October. We do offer CEUs for New York state licensed social workers. So you're welcome again to call the helpline. There's no charge for that. There will be a charge if you need uh, CEUs. It's a nominal fee, $40. And uh, you'll get two hours of, of social work uh, programs, uh, social work uh, CEUs. And again, contact the helpline at 646 seven four four two nine hundred to get more information about that. Um, we also, as I mentioned, uh, have a lot of support groups and we're always looking to expand that and to grow the number of support group leaders. So if any of you are professionals or family caregivers who are no longer actively caregiving, you know, we provide training and support for our care uh, for our support group leaders. So I encourage you to, to inquire on the helpline about that <clears throat> as well. 
A um, couple of events coming up that I want to mention to you. One is our uh, Alzheimer's, uh, Caring Kind Alzheimer's Walk in Central Park uh, on October 23rd. Uh, we'd love you to join us, you know, bring your friends, bring your dogs, bring your kids. Uh, and uh, it is, it, you know, yes, it's a fundraising event, but it's also a community event. And I think for people who have experienced um, caring for a relative or are experiencing caring for a relative or living with the disease, it really provides a powerful sense of community and connection. Um, and literally people taking, you know, uh, a step forward and uh, and banding together. It's, it'll be, we'll have some really interesting speakers and uh, some entertainment and it's a fun walk. It's at um, registrations at nine o'clock. Again, you can find out all this information on our website at caringkindnyc.org. So we'd love to have as many people there uh, as possible. It's looking good and there's always room for more. So, you know, please join us. And lastly, we have a program called uh, Connect to Culture, which I think some of you might be aware of, which where we have done some training, some very extensive training with the arts and cultural organizations in New York City uh, to make their um, programs and services available to uh, people with dementia and their family members. So we've worked with some of the large museums and the cultural arts organizations, performing arts organizations like uh, Lincoln Center. And uh, we have two programs coming up with one of our partners, which is uh, Orpheus Chamber Orchestra. So on <clears throat> October 19th from two to three um, at our office, there will be musicians from uh, Orpheus Chamber Orchestra, I'm just showing you the flyer, uh, who will be here. And so uh, they'll share some of their stories and certainly much of their music with us. And so uh, you're welcome to attend and you can find out more about that at the, on the uh, website or call the helpline. And then uh, the next day, October 20th, um, at the Queens Botanical Gardens, we're doing something called Orpheus Reflections, a classical music concert for those living with dementia and their caregivers in the beautiful setting of the Queens Botanical Garden. And um, so you are um, certainly welcome to join us if you're uh, a resident of Queens or you can get yourself to Queens. It's a beautiful, beautiful place to, to listen to music. So uh, we're doing as much as we can to kind of enrich and uh, enrich the environment for people living with dementia. Yes, Ms. Rogers. Put yourself on mute or take yourself off mute. Okay, so I just wanted to ask, are these, which sound great, available by Zoom? I mean, yes. it's wonderful. Well, well, Most of us were not going to Queens for... Right, right. Some Many of the programs that we do with Connect to Culture, and actually, if you look on the website, you'll find many programs that are already recorded and available, so you can uh, enjoy Good. it with the person that you're caring for, or if you're in a professional capacity, you can let people know about it. So wonderful. Look at the Connect to Culture programs. Actually, everything we do now is, is either virtual or hybrid. Uh, we're slowly coming back to in-person activities. Um, and I must say, New York is, uh, I was, our offices are midtown and I'm thinking things are really kind of, you know, uh, coming back to life again, which is really very exciting. Um, so one, one, one other um, just housekeeping um, mention for you is that we will be sending out um, a survey, a questionnaire at the end, so you can give us some feedback about tonight's program. And um, so with that, oh, I did just also want to mention that, that um, our programs, we have been focused on reaching out to the diverse communities of New York, within the Latino community, the African-American community, the Chinese community, where we've done a lot of successful outreach. Um, and most recently with the Orthodox community, specifically in Brooklyn, but in Queens and other boroughs as well, and with the LGBT community. So um, we hope to be as inclusive uh, and make sure that our programs are available to everybody who could benefit from them. Um, so, and one of the programs that we do on a regular basis is our Monday educational meeting, such as this. And so it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening. 
uh, Dr. Stephen G. Post. Uh, I've been working with Stephen for, I don't know, 20 years, I don't know, more probably. Uh, I think you were in Cleveland at the time. And um, so Dr. Post is uh, internationally recognized for his work with deeply forgetful people, which is a term that he has coined, which is a much kinder term than people with dementia and a much less judgmental term. And he'll talk to you about them. Uh, so his book, The Moral Challenge of Alzheimer's Disease, Ethical Issues from Diagnosis to Dying, was designated a medical classic of the century by the British Medical Journal. His research on the dynamics of compassionate care in the lives of persons with dementia and their caregivers resulted in his being elected a member of the Medical and Scientific Advisory Board of Alzheimer's Disease International. He's also one of only several recipients of the Alzheimer's Association's National Distinguished Service Award in recognition of personal and professional outreach to the Alzheimer's Association Network on ethics issues important to people with Alzheimer's and their families. Um, he is renowned for his work on compassionate care at the interface of science, art, ethics, spiritual thought, and behavioral medicine. He's the president of the Institute for Research on Unlimited Love. It says, I think that says it all, which he co-founded with philanthropist Sir John Templeton, who personally selected him as president in 2001. He's also founding director of the Center for Medical Humanities, Compassionate Care, and Bioethics at Stony Brook University School of Medicine in New York, where he started in 2008 where he also serves as professor of family, population, and preventative medicine and head of the division of medicine in society. So he is a recipient of the National Endowment for Humanities Top Public Speaker Award. And he uses a highly engaging style with a mix of stories and anecdotes and uh, personal reflections, clinical and philosophical perspectives to uh, engage and inspire his audiences. And, um, he continues to travel the globe, speaking about those with memory issues and sharing about the transformative benefits of kindness, volunteering, spirituality, forgiveness, and purpose. And most recently, Stephen is the author, Dr. Post is the author of this book called Dignity for Deeply Forgetful People, How Caregivers Can Meet the Challenges of Alzheimer's Disease. He presents a different perspective and a different way of looking at the disease without diminishing or dismissing, I think, what many people's experience of it is. So it's it's not a Pollyanna-ish kind of approach to, you know, uh, to the to the disease, but it's a deep understanding of what the individual living with dementia and their family members are experiencing. So uh, it's published by Johns Hopkins Press and it's available wherever you can buy books, which is pretty much anywhere <laughs> online or in, or in your bookstore. So I, you know, again, I highly recommend it. It's very, very, it's a very thoughtful. And I will tell you that there is a blurb on the back of this book from the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama himself has said, I am pleased to see that the noted author, Dr. Stephen G. Post is addressing themes such as consciousness and interconnectedness in his new book, which will contribute to the flourishing of humanity. So with that, I give you Dr. Post. Stephen, thank you. Thank, thank you, Jed. You know, I uh, I would have been okay with, well, he's his wife's husband. <laughs> <laughs> you are that. Yeah, 40 years, can you imagine? Um, I thank you, Jen, and I thank Caring Kind, and I'm not going to be long-winded in um, this presentation. I'm, I'm going to present some ideas and then invite your responses and hope that we can have a meaningful and valuable community dialogue around some of these uh, some of these thoughts. So I am going to start off with a PowerPoint. Okay. That's Maybe good. just to think about 
caring, kind, and community. It's nice to have an image. I think a lot of you are aware of this one. It's Norman Rockwell's <clears throat> The Golden Rule. Everybody is meditating on the idea of doing unto others, of contributing to their lives. And that's what caregiving is all about. He actually did this painting, it's worth mentioning. In 1960, it appeared on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post. Mm -hmm. No relation, by the way. Hmm. And um, they fired him for it, even though it was brilliant and it injected um, the civil rights movement into American culture. They fired him because he, he depicted people of color in a serious, non-trivializing way. So do you see uh, this um, little girl on the lower left? Mm -hmm. That's Ruby Bridges with her school books in her hands. And she was the one who uh, that year had led the way uh, in New Orleans for the integration of a school system uh, and was really one of the great initial civil rights activists. But all of these people are actually somebody. There are stories behind them all, and I won't go into it, but uh, Rockwell believed that if we just focus our minds and hearts on what we can do for others, we can live more peaceful and tranquil and cherishing lives. So I was up in high school in New Hampshire, and he, he actually came up from Stockbridge, Massachusetts, and he gave a talk about the golden rule, and, and he said, can you see the halo? For those of you who do art and observation, can you see the halo? Well, it's that white circle in the middle, beginning with the rabbi's beard, and then going over here and up above, and he said he wasn't particularly religious, but he believed that if you get into the flow of helping others, you can catch whatever there is in this universe that's worth catching. Um, and uh, so it's a really, it's a beautiful image to think about, uh, not only as caregivers, but also just as um, people living in a very acrimonious uh, time. Okay, so this is a quote from a famous man named Sir John Eccles, who I ran into at the University of Chicago as a student a long, long time ago. He got the Nobel Prize for discovering every basic fact we know about the communication between brain cells at the synapse. He was a neurophysiologist. He was a great scientist, but he didn't think that biology and matter could explain mind and personal identity. So this is a quote. I maintain that the human mystery is incredibly demeaned by scientific reductionism with its claim in promissory materialism to account eventually for all of the spiritual world in terms of patterns of neuronal activity. This belief must be classed as a superstition. We have to recognize that we are spiritual beings with souls existing in a spiritual world, as well as material beings with bodies and brains existing in a material world. I'm not gonna take a position on that, but obviously he did not think that mind and memory could be fully explained by tissues, cells, and brain. Nor did Marie Bergson or Ralph Waldo Emerson or T.S. Eliot or the Buddha or Gandhi or Jung or Huxley or Larry Dossi or any of these great people. They just thought that somehow or another, our brains could have some physiological deterioration but underneath that loss, there would still be a person full and 
essentially intact. It's an interesting thing. Thomas Nagel is the most famous philosopher at NYU now. He'd been at Princeton for 30 years. He wrote a book called Mind and Cosmos, why the materialist neo-Darwinian conception of nature is almost certainly false. In other words, he would side with Eccles, and he still does. You know, there are these remarkable studies that have come out. Uh, this is about hydrocephalics, uh, infants born with hydrocephaly. And studies show that intelligent adults with fine memory, but no more than 5% of normal brain, their tissue having been cured of hydrocephaly as children, uh, it, it shows that they have fine memory and can interact in normal ways. So he suggests three models, a kind of standard idea of memory, which somehow is understood in a chemical or physical form in the brain. Um, another model would be long-term memories held in the brain in some minute subatomic form as of yet unknown. And then this one is really interesting. Um, information relating to long-term memory is held outside the brain. Can you even believe that he would write this in a very distinguished journal? But actually, it's an idea that's been out there for about 30 years. Way, way back in 1993, the famous Simon Berkovich was speculating that the brain is kind of like a local computer terminal, the one on your desk. And it's connected to some larger informational system. Many of these great neurologists have said visual memory, you know, it's one thing to talk about habitual memory, but visual memory, the ability to just in a millisecond conjure up a vision of the whole ocean and the whole sky and the whole beach and a beautiful scene that you remember from 50 years ago. Uh, he didn't think, Foresight didn't think, but a lot of people don't think that that's understandable without some sort of invocation of mystery. Visual memory poses a challenge to neural models of memory storage and retrieval, which must be able to account for such a large and detailed storage capacity. Okay, so. Why do I begin there? Because sometimes you hear a lot of negative language around people who are deeply forgetful. They're a husk, they're a shell, they're gone. I've heard it in clinics. I've heard it in intensive care units. I've heard it in politics. You know, a politician will refer to somebody who is an adversary as demented. It's just a quite a troubling thing. Um, so what is dignity to, to hold someone in grace, uh, a, a quality of being worthy of honor and respect? I went with the great neurologist, Joe Mike, Joseph Michael Foley, who was from Cleveland. Uh, he'd come there from Harvard and he was at Case. And he really recruited me out there in 1988 for 20 wonderful years. And we went to a, a town called Mount Vernon which is in the middle of Ohio. It's about an hour and a half south of Cleveland. And there was a geriatric psychiatric hospital with a whole wing devoted to uh, individuals with Down syndrome who were now in their 50s or more and almost ubiquitously have evidence of dementia. So they may have taken, their families may have taken great pride in every developmental threshold that was reached, but now, it's especially difficult because they're seeing that development in reverse. And there were a number of wonderful, wonderful caregivers. And they were actually, they were from India. And, uh, you know, clearly uh, by their garb and symbols, they were Hindus. And uh, they lived in a community there in Mount Vernon. So Joe and I were so impressed by the tone of their voice, by their diligence, by their attention to details, by their patience, their forgiveness it was incredible. Uh, so we took a few of them out to a pizza restaurant in Gambier, Ohio, 
uh, and um, we asked them why they cared so deeply for these individuals. These weren't relatives. Why did they do that? And they said, namaste, which I think everybody knows is the Hindu greeting, the Hindu expression. But it's not just how are you, like we do in the West. It's um, I honor, literally, I honor the divine in you as you honor the divine in me. Whatever your concept of that might be, I have no idea and wouldn't need to know. But I'm simply saying that they, as Hindus, found these people, although they were deeply forgetful, they were still of infinite value. And the cover of this book, you know, I had nothing to do with the artwork here. The Hopkins people did it. But I liked it because it sort of presented an opaque image. If this is cotton, maybe this is something else, but uh, it's fall, it's a little faded, uh, but still it's there. And that's been what I've thought ever since I did assisted oral feeding with my grandmother post when I was just a kid at a nursing home in New York. That was before they ever had anything like feeding pegs or artificial nutrition and hydration that only showed up in 1985 in nursing homes. And a lot of people aren't very comfortable that it ever did. But at any rate, I did assisted oral feeding with my grandmother. And most of the time she couldn't remember my name. She couldn't converse. But you know, with that applesauce and so forth, there was a kind of a ritualistic communication. And we connected. And I could see the, the brightness in her eyes. Uh, I could occasionally uh, just feel very much her emotional presence. And then, as I describe in the book, hope is being open to surprises. She might actually, sporadically, just call out Stevie. That was it. And it was very meaningful to me. So I grew up with the idea that no one is ever gone. I don't like the word dementia, never have, because it's a negative word. It's very much like the word retardation. Dementia is a decline from a former mental state. So you're a declined person. I don't view it that way. Um, deeply forgetful people. You know, we all have our moments. It is a spectrum. Like obviously, uh, you know, you can be in extreme forgetfulness and talk about dementia, but on the whole, it's a spectrum. So deep forgetfulness is more inclusive. You know, I was out behind this building in the parking lot not too long ago, and I had to ask a medical student, do you know where my car is parked? She laughed. But then <laughs> to make matters even worse, I asked somebody not long after, I was under a lot of stress. Do you know if I drove to work today? And they just cracked up because there is a difference between forgetting where you parked your car and forgetting that you have a car that's parked. Stress will do that. And by the way, no neurologist I know of thinks these days that stress is not a significant factor in the evolution of deep forgetfulness, dementia, and Alzheimer's disease. It causes hippocampal atrophy a slight disintegration of the hippocampus, which is where short-term memories are laid down. And we live in what Austin called the age of anxiety. So does that make Alzheimer's really a modern condition? If you go back a hundred years, people got dementia, which is a syndrome of symptoms, but it was caused by what? Well, mainly by neurosyphilis, by syphilis. Right? People weren't living so long, they didn't have antibiotics. So dementia was caused by syphilis. There wasn't much so-called Alzheimer's around. Deep forgetfulness is more respectful. It's almost mystical in a way. Um, it suggests that maybe we should work harder to notice continuing selfhood, identity, and purpose. I tell the story in the book about a fellow who with deep forgetfulness who came to an art therapy class in the mornings and he just scribbled in black crayon on a on a piece of paper 
It was chaos, but there was always a line right down the middle. People would ask him, what's that mean? He could never respond. But then one morning, being open to surprises, he responded. He said, it's a map so my daughter can find her way to my house. Got it? Point is, there can be levels of purpose underlying behaviors that we are not aware of, but we have to work really hard as caregivers to notice them. Dementia disconnects us from the experience of them. But as I say, we all have our moments. I'm in a big med school. Here's 500 medical students. I know them all. But, you know, on any given day, I'll forget half the names. It's just too much, you know, and I'm a little bit embarrassed and I have to come confabulate a bit. Um, you know, uh, there are many situations in life where our memories fade. That's called pseudo dementia. In other words, memories come back from depression and whatever. But we shouldn't think of their experience as somehow different from our own. And then we shouldn't label them as husk gone empty shell. Martin Luther King spoke about the beloved community. And he said, language opens the door to the beloved community. Dementia opens the door to no one. I'm sorry, it opens the door to no one. Deep forgetfulness opens the door, I, I hope. You know, in the book, I talk a lot about paradoxical lucidity. There was an article in Alzheimer's and Dementia about this. This is Now, you, you're all caregivers, a lot of you are. I bet you've experienced this. It's the unexpected lucidity and communication in patients with severe dementias, especially around the time of death. I don't believe that, but just generally people who surprise you with these moments of lucidity. And we don't understand that, but it provides insight into potential mechanisms, uh, ethics, considerations for scientific investigation. And so the National Institute on Aging of the NIH put out a request for proposals a couple of years ago, asking if great scientists could find ways to study paradoxical lucidity. Because if we could understand what's going on in the brain in those moments when people sort of come back into themselves, maybe that would give us a key to unlock this problem. I'm not going to talk about the Gallup organization except to say that I'm working on a national survey of caregivers adult caregivers, trying to find out how many experience these moments of lucidity with their loved ones, how long these moments endure. Are they prompted? Are they sporadic? What are they meaning to the caregiver who now maybe can see that grandma's still there? That to me has always been the million dollar question. I was giving a talk at the Time Center in 2013. And uh, it was on dementia. And I was talking about continuity of self-identity. And I was on the panel with this wonderful woman, Olivia Hobblezell, who'd written a book, 10,000 Joys and 10,000 Sorrows. Note the title. It's not just about sorrow and burden. Okay, the burden language is serious and, and we all experience it. I mean, I've done a fair amount of caring for people with deep forgetfulness. There is a burden and you can see it and it's very difficult to manage without support, but there's also the joy of it and the meaning of it. So she emailed me when she got back to Boston and this is what she said in that late stage when words are gone, except for those very occasional moments, she, meaning her mom, looked at me intently and said forcefully, God, physics, and the cosmos. Her mother was a professor at MIT. So some years ago, uh, actually 2015, uh, I was invited to go to the Indian Institute for Advanced Studies, which is in Bangalore. 
and we did a whole conference on consciousness and ethics and deeply forgetful people. And there were Indian neurologists and Indian philosophers galore. And I talked about how I rejected Western ethics because we put so much weight on cognitive dexterity. And I coined, coined the word hypercognitive values. You probably heard of hypocognitive, but hypercognitive, that you could be too into cognitive values like a lot of academics are. I'm not a really good academic, but I can say that anyway. Um, but hypercognitive values, instead of the things that really matter, the love, the kindness, the connection, the community that you see in something like caring kind. So I was giving this talk and there was a stirring in the back of the room, a couple hundred people there and um, somebody after I was done stood up, put his hand on the table and he said, that's right. There is no reason to value someone less because they are deeply forgetful. And that's why His Holiness endorsed the book. Because he shows up in Bangalore at that institute quite a lot. So that's his view. It's consciousness. You know, someone can still enjoy, as you all know, uh, awe before the beauty of nature. The setting sun, the rising sun. I tried to go do Google and it said it should have been Google call home. So oh. I can see everybody, but they can't see me because it says unmute. But it's under your name, Wally Bryant. Okay, I'm just going to keep going through this. Can you come down a second? How do you un 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 unmute something? They're just going to see me. Hold on. Well, at any rate, so. Me. This is the point. You have to unmute it. Can be deeply forgetful, but they can still See, under your name have tremendous. No, I can worry about this, right? Okay. Now, if you accept hypercognitive values, you're going straight to the Nazis. Straight to the Nazis. The T4 project in Berlin, 1939 to 1941, what happened? They took 70,000 people out of asylums. The historian Benno Mueller Hill says half of them probably had cognitive developmental disabilities and half of them probably have dementia. And these were people were left to freeze. Oh, wait, I'm you. These people were left in cold water they were brought into the asylums and then thawed out in different mediums at different temperatures. The Nazis said, well, we're doing this because we wanna know at what point it becomes futile to send rescue teams into the cold waters of the North Atlantic. But according to Nazi hypercognitive ideology, these people are life unworthy of life, useless eaters. And these, by the way, were not members of discriminated against groups. They weren't Jews or gypsies or gays or Polish Catholics. They were Aryans, pure-blooded Aryans, but they had one thing going against them, which was that their memories were not strong. And so I won't go into this in depth, except to say that the greatest medical ethicist who ever lived, a neurologist named Leo Alexander at Tufts, was a medic in World War too, and he actually wrote the Nuremberg Code, and he saw all the hideous abuse of deeply forgetful people and people with spina bifida and all kinds of other things. And he wrote an article in the New England Journal of Medicine, most widely read article in American medical history, Medical Science Under Dictatorship, 1949. And what he said was that the only thing that can protect these vulnerable populations is a voluntary association like Caring Kind and many others, the ALS Society, the whatever, you know, there are so many of these and they're all important, ARC. Um, because between the state and the wider public, you've got to have organizations that really advocate for the dignity and the decency 
that these people deserve. So, you know, you look at America today and you've got to ask something about this. Like, you know, we have spend down policies for you to qualify for certain kinds of benefits, mm -hmm. right? You got to spend down, I don't know what it is. A few years ago, it was 15 or $20,000 sort of remaining assets in your house or whatever. It's not a lot. Um, you know, in Canada, in Switzerland, in the Netherlands, in Canada, I've been all through Canada, every province in Canada and giving talks at the Good Samaritan organizations. So every province is organized such that, that a person who is deeply forgetful gets free state-of-the-art assisted living, nursing home, and hospice care. There's no spend down for the families. Okay. Of course, you know, they may not want to put a tube in every orifice, natural and unnatural, for these individuals. And this is one of the things that my medical students come in here sometimes in tears over because they're up in the intensive care unit and there might be 12 people and four of them are so deeply forgetful. They don't belong there. And in fact, so disoriented for them. If they came from a nursing home, they'll never get back to where they were. So, you know, we'll spend anything to rescue somebody from death. But what about caring for them? I'm not going to go into this in depth. When I say continuity is self-identity, what is there that you notice as caregivers? The creativity. The creativity never leaves. Symbolic rationality. Emotion. Relationality, including dogs. I actually co-founded the Alzheimer's dog movement in Scotland and then in Australia. Now it's all over Europe. Yeah. Mirth, somatics, music and rhythm, beauty, smell, taste, spirituality, touch, consciousness. That's a lot. That's a whole lot there. And we have to connect with it. This is Joe Foley. The only guy who was the president of both the American Neurological Association and the American Society for Neuroscience. We went to a place called Heather Hill on a nursing home in Chardon, Ohio. And uh, we went into a room. This is, we went into the special memory unit. Everybody had their own uh, room, uh, bedroom, but then they were out in a common area during most of the day. And we read the biographical sketch, which is a very important thing to support dignity, the bio sketch of a guy named Jim. And we knew he had a couple of sons, Zach and Louie, we knew he'd been an, uh, an accountant. So we went out, we asked a nurse, show us, show us Jim. So I took Jim by the arm and we sat down. And I, I used language very badly. Some of this book is about how to use language. I asked him, it was just ridiculously dumb of me. How are your kids? How are your kids? What a stupid question, because I was, I could see he was stressed, even though I said it nicely. Why? Because now he had to go back into his own memory bank and come up with these words, and that was difficult for him. But when I asked him, wait a minute, how's Zach? He lit up like a rainbow. How's Louie? He was on fire. He didn't talk, but he just emotionally was so present and so joyful. He clearly still loved his sons, but I had to use language in such a way as to remind him of their names. And then there was this beat up old puppet doll. I'm telling you, you know, it's the kind of thing that you would give your daughter when she was like, you know, a year old. And this thing had to be been 70 years old. There was no hair left on it. Uh, it was just really depleted. And he walked over and he picked this thing up off the floor and he went to the corner of this room and there was a, a woman whimpering and crying in her chair. And he quietly placed it on her lap and then he walked away and she stopped crying. And I asked the nurse, so what's the story with that doll? And the nurse said, that that was her doll. 
So somehow Jim, despite his memory issues, still had a lot of emotional intelligence. And I think that that's often the case. And there are an awful lot of people who are fully memory intact, who don't have much emotional intelligence, need I say that. So Jim's twig, I'm not even going to go into this in depth, but he did have a white twig that was painted white, and he put it in my palms. And when he did, he smiled. This, this, if, if a smile was electric, the place would have been on fire. <clears throat> and I asked the nurse, what's the story with his twig? Well, he grew up on a farm. He loved his father very much. And like a lot of people, he'd gone back symbolically to a point he associated with tender, loving care because his father gave him a chore every morning, which was to bring kindling in for the fireplace. So with that symbol, symbolic rationality never leaves. He was back where he wanted to be. Thomas Carlyle, the great writer, it is through symbols that man consciously or unconsciously lives, works, and has his being. St. Augustine, symbols are powerful because they are the visible signs of invisible realities. <clears throat> you know, I had a friend at Yale Divinity School um, named Leander Keck. He was a New Testament scholar. And his wife, Janet, you know, she became very deeply forgetful and would just get lost around the Div School and people had to guide her around. But I'll tell you, when she went to the chapel service, she could connect with the deeply learned music that she remembered from her youth. She would chime in for the hymns, not just for a line or two, but for the whole hymn. And people were shocked. But she did this regularly. And then she could connect with the stained glass windows. She could connect with the prayers that she remembered. So somehow or another, the symbolic nature of the universe, casere, we live in symbols, and symbols live in us. The symbolic nature of human beings was still there. I'm going to wind down here. This is a picture by Willem de Kooning, an abstract expressionist artist, you know, guy who hung around Bleecker Street and got in fights a lot in front of the Cafe Wa. Great painter, full of anxiety. One of these people who sort of believes the myth, I don't do nothing for nothing. You ever hear that? <laughs> so. Anyway, he was diagnosed with probable Alzheimer's at um, Cornell Weill uh, by Norman Relkin years ago. For 14 years, he painted. Actually, 13 and a half of 14 years before he died, he painted. And his painting <clears throat> didn't have the rough edge of anxiety, the kind of scary quality of this work. It was more like this. It was full of gentle lines. It was full of bright colors, greens and yellows and blues. And, and I almost thought it was a posthumous exhibit that this showed that somehow in his deep forgetfulness, he'd become disinhibited and gotten more in touch with certain aspects of human nature that I think are very positive. I don't say that to be Pollyannish. I say that because I think that's what that's what happened to him. Oh, the critics, they said, oh, he was a shell, he was a husk. But the one I liked said, wait a minute, this guy had dementia for 14 years and for 13 and a half years, he knew he was an artist. He, would, he, was, in a, he was in a studio in Greenwich Village and he had an assistant. Of course, symbolically, he always wore his dungarees because he knew that his identity was wrapped up with that symbol. And he just sporadically rise up, dip his paint in the acrylic and he'd go up to the easel. That's how he spent his time. He knew he was an artist. I'm not going to go into a lot of these things. Aaron Copeland, if you ever have a chance, we don't have a chance to do it today, but there's a beautiful uh, YouTube of Aaron Copeland who spent the last four years of his life with quite significant deep forgetfulness in Peekskill, New York. And... Uh, people would come up and visit him because he was the great composer. And he couldn't communicate by speech. But lo and behold, he was known to just unexpectedly rise up. And he would go to the piano. And he would play the six notes 
da 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 that form the two chords that are the framework of Appalachian Spring. So what was he trying to say? Was he trying to say, I'm still here? I think so. Was he trying to say, this is what I want to be remembered for? I think so. Dogs. I was on the board of the uh, Alzheimer's Association in, uh, in Scotland once upon a time. And um, there's a lot of interest. This has got to be 30 years ago. A lot of interest in dogs and people who are demented. So they started to train small Labrador retrievers. And it turns out that they did a heck of a lot of good for these deeply forgetful people. Of course, if you already have one, that's a great asset too, because the dog doesn't care if you're a little forgetful. <laughs> no, doesn't care. Mm -hmm. um, and um, this is dogsfordementia.com.au. The Australians have taken this farther than anybody. Um, the dogs are carefully chosen to match household personalities, trained to meet specific needs. It's incredible. Everybody with dementia has a dementia dog in Australia. Look at all that tactile stimulation. It's really cool. So I was in Brooklyn Heights a few years back before COVID. I was giving a talk on the dogs. Um, and I got an email from Meryl Berdugo. And this is what she said. It's kind of an interesting email. Bringing Lola to see Alzheimer's patients has made a tremendous difference in helping me open up the line of communication. Take Marvin, who's 91, lives at home with his wife. He's got advanced AD, Alzheimer's. He has a full-time aide and sleeps in his own room while his wife has the master bedroom. Marvin had walked into her bedroom, fell asleep in the bed since the morning. The aide and his wife couldn't get him up. I walked in the room with Lola, put her paws on him and said, Marvin, get up. Look who came to visit. Marvin popped up, excited to see Lola. I was able to lure him out of bed and into the family room where his wife was. He couldn't contain his excitement. His wife and the aide couldn't believe it. Lowly brought back his memory of his dog, Sparky. So there you go. Hey, caregivers, sing with your loved one. That's rule number one. Many caregivers report that it's uplifting for them and their loved one. Something they know, this is like music and memory, but you don't need an, iP an iPod necessarily, just Go for it. And by the way, it's important to distinguish active from passive hope, right? Active hope is what you can do in this moment to make the life of your loved one and yourself better. When you bring someone back into themselves through music, it may not last long, but that doesn't really matter because it's great for the caregiver to see I like to use this word, grandma's still there. That's chapter seven of the book. <clears throat> there are books being written now about positive psychology and dementia. This is the best book there is, in my opinion, out there. Um, positive psychology. It's about the strengths that we can bring to life, forgiveness, kindness creativity, mirth, listening, noticing, and so forth. This is where we need to move. So my book, you know, it's got, uh, it's, got its own vision of positive psychology. I, I call love, <clears throat> really, what is it? When the happiness and security of another is as real to us as our own, we love that person. But the word love is kind of hard to use in our culture. Love of designer jeans, love of chocolate and so forth. That's all okay, but you know. So the main thing is what are the manifestations of love? Compassion, helping, forgiveness, gratitude, respect, celebration, listening, loyalty, creativity. A, 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 a term I coined with M. Scott Peck when he was alive and living in Groton, Connecticut. Carefrontation. 
not confrontation. So this is the positive psychology of the caregiver. And what is hope? Hope is a big part of positive psychology. Being open to surprises and noticing them. But you've got to be willing to notice them. I like Gayatri Devi's book, The Spectrum of Hope. She, make, she points out that Alzheimer's is not just a genetically hardwired thing. <clears throat> That's a factor. But how you interact, how you interact makes a difference in the actual biological course of the condition. Because we know we have neuroplasticity. We have genetic malleability. So how you interact what you bring to this will actually affect the course of the disease. Purpose, that's a big concept in positive psychology. Looking at older adults, this is out of uh, Rush Presbyterian in Chicago. Um, older adults who were rated high quartile on purpose of life had a 30% lower rate of cognitive decline than the low quartile. So when you've got a purpose, you know, it's good for your mind. Usually somewhat involved in helping others in a meaningful way. Shakespeare and Picasso both said, the meaning of life is to find your gift. The purpose of life is to give it away. I'm going <clears> to <throat> let this go now. Suffice it to say, can this be prevented? At last, in the last few years, the Lancet Commission on Dementia, yes, Modifiable risk factors over, the, over your midlife include head injuries. So I played ice hockey at St. Paul's in New Hampshire, and I got banged around a lot, uh, you know, checking people into the walls and so forth. And I'm so shocked that I'm hanging out as well as I am. But, um, <clears throat> you know, head injuries in midlife, alcohol consumption, definitely a problem. You know, I don't drink because I, I, I don't drink a drop. Never. I, my father was, was, was a pretty heavy drinker. And as he got older, you know, he became more demented. Maybe air pollution. You know, there are some public health people who actually think that lead is a factor. Can you believe that? That lead in the environment could be, we just don't know. We don't know anything, really. Sedentary lifestyle. People are talking about walking a half an hour a day so that you beef up your circulation. Um, I don't have an RX, but, you know, plenty of greets, greet, greens and fruits, walking, cognitive stimulation, social and intellectual engagement, sleep, lots of stuff in recent years on sleep and resting the brain as being somewhat preventive. Meditation, there's a great organization called alzheimerspreventionorg I recommend it for everybody who's out in Arizona. And Dama Khalsa, MD, uh, you know, I said earlier, stress is a factor. It's not just genetics. Stress is a factor in hippocampal deterioration. So if you can be mindful and meditational, that's a good thing. Music and memory is great, too. So there are things, you know, we need to, we need to think about this problem, not in terms of some magic bullet, which I don't think there's ever going to be, because it's too complicated. It's not like AIDS. HIV, once you figured out the retrovirus, then um, they could figure out the three drug cocktail and it was lickety split and it made it into a sort of a chronic manageable uh, illness. David Ho uh, did that at uh, Rockefeller. Uh, but you know, uh, this is a very complicated disease and honestly speaking, no true scientist thinks they know what causes it. That's why the pharma has been so chaotic because they don't know what to aim at, right? Everybody thought, well, it's the hippocampus and the so-called cholinergic hypothesis. That didn't work out. Nothing's worked out. And even the plaques and so forth, people think maybe that's just a downstream after effect sort of by the George Washington Bridge of something that's going on, on up by the tap and zero. I guess they call it the Mario Cuomo. <laughs> so we just don't know anything about uh, causality. Go back, I'm going to wind up here. You know, uh, this is 1995, Chicago, the Alzheimer's National Meeting. A world without Alzheimer's. People were saying, we're going to lick this in five years. 
I'm not even going to go into this history because it's it's just not very impressive. But in the meanwhile, that passive hope, they're going to come up with something. It's okay to hope. I mean, I, I'm all for it. And if a good medication comes along, fantastic. And it's a good thing. But 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 it's not a magic bullet. Even the best stuff we have now, and I think it's probably worth prescribing in many cases. Um, but you know, if on a scale of one to 10, 10 is a really effective drug. Insulin is a very effective drug for diabetes. Um, what we have for Alzheimer's is probably about a one. You know, it has, it, and Joe Foley said this, it's not, it has no impact on underlying course of the disease. Uh, you know, you, you may get slight improvements in certain areas, but that quickly diminishes because it's still a downward course. As Peter Whitehouse said, Dr. Peter Whitehouse, who discovered the cholinergic hypothesis and was my colleague for 20 years at Case Medical, he said, what we have is like treating a brain tumor with aspirin. And aspirin can do a lot for brain tumor for certain symptoms, but it has no effect on the underlying problem itself. So all these ethical issues, think about them now, um, you know, advanced planning, pain, nutrition, and hydration. This is a, just a study about 1999. They took older adults um, in a primary care waiting room and they did surveys and they asked them, what would you want in terms of life-sustaining procedures in the face of dementia? 95% said nothing. Nothing. And that's a statistical way of saying 100%. Okay. I won't go into why that is, but it is the case. And so that means not just, you know, do I want a feeding pig? It means what, I, you know, I'm on dialysis. Do I want to continue the dialysis? Maybe there's going to come a point where I don't want dialysis. Why? Because that butterfly needle that goes into the bovine graft in my wrist, if that's how it's being done, I don't have any insight into what that's for. So as I interpret it subjectively, it's somewhere on a range between assault and torture. So why would you want to do that? People can have chronic cardiac problems. Now you see the technology around that stuff. It's amazing. You know, why, why would you put someone through that if they have no insight into the why of it? So that's how I personally argue in this book. Even the mortality curves on people um, in the end stage, you live longer with assisted oral feeding. What I was doing with my grandmother, you live longer than you do with a feeding pig. Because with a feeding pig, you're getting a, a bolus of stuff that's not really natural and not really uh, what you're used to. And so people... Um, uh, can't handle it, and it comes up into their esophagus, and they get uh, um, they get uh, pneumonia as a result. Aspiration pneumonia. Aspiration pneumonia. Yeah, you don't get us. You don't get that much with assisted oral feeding, but you get aspiration pneumonia with uh, the feeding pig. Just FYI. Um, I like this. This is a cookbook. Debbie Johnson, nutrition and Alzheimer's disease, doing things like they do it in Iowa. All for it. Juicy gelatin. I did this with my grandmother Appleson's book. Because again, they never introduced the, the feeding pig was never even introduced until 1985 in an American uh, nursing home. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was never ever used in Canada, never has been used in Canada. Right. So um, assisted oral feeding is the way to go. I won't talk about pain, except that there was a time before the year 2000 when people with dementia were never given palliative care, zero, zilch. And that was because everybody assumed that if they were screaming in agony, it was because they were demented, right? Mm -hmm. And then Greg Sachs, who I'm sure some of you, Jed probably is aware of him. Jed Sachs actually uh, studied this. And look, they're just like any other people. They have arthritis, they have other chronic conditions. I mean, I'm getting older, I got a bad uh, C6, <laughs> okay? So um, they came up with the pain AD scale for assessing pain. I use this very widely in my own, in my own work. I, I consult on this. Scales focus on breathing, 
vocalization, facial expression, body language, behaviors can be used in just several minutes, but you get used to it. You can pick up pain levels and then you can actually medicate for pain. Nothing wrong with that. So I've said too much. And this is just a painting by my favorite artist, Mark Chagall, who I think uh, he would have understood that uh, deeply forgetful people need to be treated with dignity and honor and respect. And he would have wanted to love them. He said, blue is the color of love. Mm. And I think that's, that's all I can say or have to say, okay? Whether it's useful or not, I got no idea. Thank you, Stephen. I have a couple of comments. Um, uh, yeah, so people are, are uh, you know, very thought provoking. I think one of the things I want, I think you, especially for you who are caregiving, is that the same kind of attention that Stephen is focusing on the individual who is deeply forgetful, that we need to turn that towards ourselves mm -hmm. as well and treat ourselves with those, those kinds of the strength of forgiveness and kindness and compassion and respect and especially forgiveness. Because I think those of us who are caregiving often make, you know, uh, we're human and we have limits of patience and we get irritated and we get annoyed. And, you know, there's a, that whole range. So I think everything that, that Dr. Post is talking about in terms of treating that forgetful individual, deeply forgetful people, I think we need to take those same messages and um, reflect it to towards ourselves as well. I also, a couple of other comments. One is that, um, I, you know, an, an example of that symbolic rationality and something that um, our former CEO, Llewellyn Barkin, who, uh, whose own mother was developing dementia. And as she said, she became her own client here at Caring Kind. And, um, and when she was, she placed her mother in residential care and she did it on a Sunday. And her mother was very kind of restless and agitated and upset. And it was not just being in a new environment. And she was, Llewellyn was in New York, the, the residential, the assisted living was in, in Florida. And she had a brainstorm and she said to the um, administrator at the assisted living, she said, you know what, it's Sunday, go out and get a New York Times, which she could get in that part of Florida where she was because her mother was so used to having that New York, whether she could read it or not, it wasn't the, it was just the presence the feeling of that paper and that connection, and it worked. She just calmed down because she was, you know, on some level, she knew it was Sunday and she was looking for the times. And believe me, I can understand. <laughs> I can relate to that. So, you know, this, this, these things that are symbolic and meaningful, um, I think are, are important to, to, I think that's such a, a brilliant insight that you have, Stephen. Um, it's so, so helpful. Um, I, um, a couple of words also just in terms of, of the medications. And I agree with, you know, Stephen, that, you know, the medications that we have are not where we want them to be, but in the absence of anything better, they certainly should be tried. And there's been so much chaos and confusion around some recent, you know, um, findings by the FDA. Um, however, I will, I will tell you, and some of you must have read last week in the Times about a new medication that's being put out by ASI, it's called Lecanemab, that has shows some very promising data. I still reserve the right to withhold judgment until we see how that data actually, uh, and I'm, I, I'm kind of very optimistic about this, uh, but how that data actually translates into the real world experience of people who are on that medication. And, and I, you know, from all the evidence that I've read, it looks really promising. But I think, you know, we, we've all been there before. And certainly, you know, uh, Stephen and I have been around a long time. Uh, there's been a lot of disappointment. Um, but I think there's a lot of reason to 
to hope that we will get to that point where we have not just a symptom modifying medication, but a disease modifying medication and a way of either slowing down or delaying the onset. I don't talk about Alzheimer's prevention. I think that's a little um, uh, overzealous in terms of its claim. I talk about in the terms of reducing the risk. And I think there is, and actually in November, on November 21st, we'll be holding an annual meeting on research um, talking about what do we really know about risk reduction in Alzheimer's disease. And um, uh, so I think it should be really uh, interesting because there is mounting evidence of the importance of exercise, of healthy diet, of heart healthy diet, of social engagement, of really good sleep and good um, uh, hygiene. Um, so I think, you know, there, there's really, you know, but whether it's enough to counteract against the biological um, kind of imperative of, of Alzheimer's disease, I'm not sure. <laughs> but I think, you know, it's often a mixed bag. So the people who are dealing with the vascular kind of dementia, uh, and there's, a, you know, it, it's, it's a complicated picture. But I think there is reason to hope. Um, and I think um, there, there's a lot uh, that we can learn and a lot that we can do for ourselves. And, it, and I think especially for those people who are caregivers, because the stress of caregiving and I, I say this so almost every time I speak to a group is that unless somebody has done it, they don't really get what it feels like. And that sense and, you know, of, um, of exhaustion kind of being, I think it drains resources um, that all of these things will help you continue to be the best caregiver you can be. And to get the support, to get the information. And so I'm glad, delighted to see so many of you here, you know, tonight. Um, and that that will, it will do you well in, you know, hold you in good stead in the long run. I'm going to take a look at the chat. I see we have a couple of questions here. Um, first question oh. is, what is, the intended result of medication, what needs to be treated by medication. Um, I can take that, Stephen, or? Well, you can take that. I mean, I agree with what you with what you say. I mean, ESA is a pretty good company. I mean, they've done some good work in the past. Yeah. And, you know, let's, you know, I, I, I trust them more than some other companies that will go unspecified. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. Uh, so the, the intended result of, of the current medications is really a, um, first of all, it, from what I understand is that it's not going to work with everybody. Not everybody who's on the medication is going to see any kind of effect. So for some people, it's a plateauing of where they are uh, for a period of time until that medication no longer works. So the current medications that are available um, Denepazil and Razodyne and Exelon and Momantine. Um, that's kind of what, you know, and for some people, they see a slight improvement in uh, cognitive function, being able to remember a movie they saw yesterday, perhaps, and an overall improvement in terms of a sense of well being. So for some, for some people, probably I've heard some neurologists say maybe 20%. Yeah. who take the medications to get that kind of effect. Sometimes, as I said, there's no outward benefit, but when you take them off the medication, there's a precipitous decline. So it's doing something, but it's not always so obvious to, to an outside observer. Um, I think the goal of medication is to have this disease-modifying drug that will either slow down the progression or... Uh, halt the progression where somebody is in the early stage where the quality of life can still be quite, you know, um, uh, they can still be connected in joy. And I think that actually that we can do that no matter where somebody is in the disease, that there's a way to reach them 
if you're, you know, if you recognize, if you understand that concept of hypercognitive value uh, and that people exist but beneath that cognition in terms of their spiritual, emotional, creative, social sense, social self, that that still exists underneath the cognitive, you know, chaos. Um, so uh, that's the goal, actually, is to have a disease-modifying drug that will change the course of the illness. We're not there yet. Um, and it's, so there's, you know, but I, I do think hopefully we'll get there. Um, Marcy, I'm going to just do one other question, and then we'll uh, come to um, you. Jed could, can I follow up with that? Yes. That's my question. Um, so at what point would a diagnosis um, tell a doctor that the patient needs medication? Um, obviously not, I'm presuming obviously not every patient with dementia or, or, or Alzheimer's would require medication or am I wrong? Um, and, and if, if it's not um, uh, necessi necessary, whatever that means, I mean, at what point would a, a doctor say, I think we should try uh, medication? So I think most physicians will, um, they wanna prescribe the medication as early as possible because there's evidence that it is beneficial, more beneficial earlier. And that if you start it even six months later, you're not going to make up that give that gap. Um, so when you when somebody is first experiencing symptoms, goes for a diagnostic evaluation. And by the way, that's not always so easy because the diagnostic evaluations are, it takes months now to get to see somebody in one of the major diagnostic centers, and it takes a lot of patience and waiting to get that done. Uh, but having said that, I think so earlier rather than later. And then there are other kinds of medications that are often used, uh, sometimes not, not appropriately, but in terms of dealing with some of the behavioral symptoms of the disease, the agitation, the, the confusion, the um, combativeness sometimes. Um, many times it can be dealt with more, more effectively with non-pharmacological interventions. Um, so... I hope I answered your question. Stephen, any other thoughts? I think that's all good. I mean, I, I think you have great insights into these mm -hmm. things based on your wisdom and experience. Mm -hmm. um, not everybody takes medications. No, it is a choice in the yeah. end. And, uh, you know, whether, I mean, there's always been this debate about, well, okay, if you get started on something and you stop it, will you have a precipitous decline? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm I, I'm 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 not certain of that. Um, and the other thing I've I've always wondered, um, you know, if there's a kind point in the progression of Alzheimer's dementia. Using the word "kind" is is a little bit annoying, I suppose, but it would be when people forget that they forget, because mm -hmm. before that point they're insightful into this self-effacement and frustrated by losses of capacity and memory and so forth. But at a certain point, a person forgets that they forget, and then they kind of drift into their own universe, something Oliver Sacks would write about, you know, um, the man who mistook his wife for a hat. And so even, even there, you know, um, Delaying the ons, de delaying the progression. Um, I understand it as a goal, you know, but I'm not a hundred percent sold on it. At least beyond certain limitations. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, people can forget that they forget. They can have a relatively, relatively benign emotional adjustment to deep forgetfulness. They can be mostly in the pure present. And um, that's okay. Right. Yeah. And they can still connect with things that are pleasurable to them. And, and yeah. you know, yeah. so we, you know, we, we've created a, we brought a, a program of palliative care to New York City 
from Phoenix, Arizona, from the Beatitudes campus. We worked with several nursing homes, and now we've created a guide for family members about this program. So it's available on our website, or you can call the helpline. Uh, it's called Comfort Matters. Um, uh -huh. And it really is, um, you know, recognizing that people can connect to music, to food, to chocolate, you know? Yeah. Now, pop chocolate in most people's mouths, they're gonna be happy, <laughs> you know? Uh, they're going to, you know, experience some pleasure. So, yeah. um, so there, there so, are ways of connecting. So I wanna say, I've got, a, I've got a, a class that's wrapping up in about five minutes and I have to say goodbye to them. So I just want to be around for another few minutes and, and maybe respond to one question. Maybe Jed can help me. Teddy, did you have something? Or... There, was a, there was a question here about my dad, his progressive uh, dementia. He's talking a lot without stopping before he was very quiet. Why? Uh, um, uh, would, what, do you what do you think? <laughs> why do you think? I would exactly turn that back to you, yeah. Yeah, well. Maybe, maybe he was always, um, I'm just being speculative, mm -hmm. maybe he was always um, wanting to talk a lot. But somehow experiences in life inhibited that. And now he's her coming into his own. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't have a problem with someone talking a lot. <laughs> uh, um, you know, maybe, you know, who knows maybe what he has the, a lot to say. <laughs> maybe he has a lot to say. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, that's right. Maybe there's a lot more purpose there than you could imagine. So I mean, I, I wouldn't worry about it. And if I could ask those of you who are using your phone numbers just to put a first name, rename yourself for the first name, if you're OK with that, just so we know who actually attended, that would be helpful. Yeah. Marcy, you had your hand up. Yes, thank you, uh, Jed. Thank you, Dr. Post, uh, for this very compassionate and interesting program. I mean, a lot of what you said resonated with me. I spent a total of about nine and a half years working in nursing home social work. And a good part of that time was working on units with people with dementia. And there were a couple of things that sort of came to mind that really resonated. First, when you mentioned the woman, person with the New York Times, I had a resident who read the, had read the Times and when I was finished with my paper, I used to give it to her so she could look through it. But I also, when we were doing trainings of new employees, the social workers were, we were the department that was responsible for doing the, depart on, doing the part on dementia care. And it, to bring it sort of home to people, I would usually ask how many of you are parents? And of course, many people raise their hands because in a way there's a similarity, except that when you're a parent and you don't know what your child is saying because your child is pre-verbal, you have that aspect. And then you kind of translate it to someone who's older with, with who, who's deeply forgetful. It's the same kind of dynamic at a different stage mm -hmm. in life. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I used to try, well, two other things, one is, we make an assumption that our reality, that people need to adjust to our reality. It's our reality. Someone who is deeply forgetful has a different reality. And who's really to say which reality is reality? They're both just different ways of being in the world. Mm -hmm. We've made a judgment that someone who's deeply forgetful is not, that that's not the normal spectrum of things. But who's to say? I mean, that's a philosophical question. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that when you work with people with dementia, I found it very refreshing because you are getting unfiltered emotion. Mm -hmm. Most of us, even if we're with people that we know very, very intimately, there's an unseen and an unspoken barrier. We know what's considered appropriate behavior or societally appropriate behavior. But when you get affection from someone who's deeply forgetful, you're getting unvarnished, unfiltered emotion, affection. You may also be getting unfiltered anger, but there's, yeah. something, there's something very exciting about that because it's not something that we usually experience in our day-to-day -day existence in what's considered to be normal society or no. the way we normally interact. So I, I think as much as 
being deeply forgetful is something that we all fear and would not want for ourselves or those we care about. There are some things that are very exciting or almost inspiring in a way, if you want to look at it that way. A lot of it is perception. How do we, we can choose how we want to look at the at people who are deeply forgetful. It's our choice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I got to go, but there's, I'll tell you, my wife Mitsuko is from Kyoto, Japan, and, the, and, I, and, and I actually read caregiver accounts in Japanese sometimes. And there's one very interesting one where there's a, you know, it's all patriarchal. So you've got a daughter-in-law whose father-in-law uh, has probable Alzheimer's. And, and it's early in the morning, the sun's shining, and he defecates on the tatami mat. Mm -hmm. So the daughter-in-law is ferociously scrubbing the tatami mat, trying to get it cleaned up. And then she looks up and there is her father-in-law and he's bald and his head is, you know, shining in the sun, in the morning sun. And it's all full of the sort of ambiance of, you know, enlightenment, if you will. I mean, he's living more in the pure present. Uh, he's not caught up in the anxiety of past and present and future. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously she's, you know, as a care, as a caregiver, she's rightly stressed out. And that's a, you know, the tatami mat means a lot in Japanese culture. You know, you got to keep it clean. But uh, on the other hand, um, you know, there he is and he doesn't have a care in the world. Hmm. So I got to hmm. run. I'm going to let Jed finish this up because he is he is so wonderful for all of you and i just want to thank you you know you're a great group and i i really feel honored to have mm -hmm. an opportunity to speak with you well thank you Stephen, and uh we will connect again i'm sure i hope so i hope so okay, okay. i got these students down the hall i, I got you okay. they're gonna be mad at me okay take so care like thank you very thank much you. okay bye-bye so um let me again just ask the person with 646-314-3990 if you can put your name in the chat, that would be great. Um, or just rename yourself on your on the screen, that would be helpful. And um, so, you know, I know that two hours is a long time to be on mute. So if, are there any other questions or, or thoughts before we wrap up? Yes, Francis. Um, yes. Um, thank you, Marcy. I really, really enjoyed and appreciated what you said. Um, because um, I think there's so many aspects, right? To, um, well, in any kind of illness and um, with a child or, or any, at any age. Um, perhaps with dementia, it's not so much the forgetfulness that um, as you were saying, you know, which is, quote, a problem, but it's the associated physical issues, like defecating on a tatami mat. That you have to deal with, right? And that's part of the forgetfulness. So for me, we should be, to me, we should be more, perhaps, uh, this, I'm very new to this, um, be focusing on the physical implications of dementia, uh, the impact of dementia on the physical aspects of a, of a person, um, um, which is more stressful for caregivers. I, I don't think- You, you mean the functional decline or- Yes. The functional care. decline, not the mental decline, not right. the. Although I, th I think there's a piece of the, the uh, I think for many caregivers, it's not the memory loss that that's that challenging. It is yeah. the behavioral. It is the that agitation or that confusion or the trying yes. to find themselves. Uh, for those people who experience that, not everybody does, but I think it's those um, kind of what are called the behavioral symptoms of the disease that are really most challenging, as well as the personal physical care, which is 
you know, can be very uh, difficult. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's. Because you know, I, I don't think any amount of medication is going to help with that physical part. Right, right. And I, although right. I will tell you that there are um, studies that have shown that an individual who works with you know, either occupational therapists or other kinds of you know, physical therapists that we, um, uh, you know, that they've been able to, you know, forestall some of the uh, kind of secondary disability that comes with, with the disease. So, um, but for the most part, I, 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 I agree with you, yes. Um, so Marcy, last uh, thought here. Yes, Jed, you, thank you again. Um, you mentioned very, very briefly, I believe on November 21st is the annual meeting and you mentioned, can you just mention a little bit about that or are we gonna get a notice about that? You'll, you'll get a notice. If you're on our mailing list, you'll get a notice, but it's going to be a meeting on kind of, uh, what do we really know about reducing the risk for Alzheimer's disease? And so Matthew Baumgarten, who is in charge of a, a national initiative called BOLD, uh, looking at the issues of prevention. Um, he works for the Alzheimer's Association Advocacy Organization, longtime friend and colleague. And uh, Dr. James Noble, who is a neurologist at um, Columbia University, who has also just written a new book called Navigating Dementia um, for Family Members. And uh, so he'll be talking about that as well. And I'm trying to get one other third speaker, which I can't tell you yet who that's gonna be. Uh, and uh, so it, it'll be a program much like this, although we'll probably be doing some in-person as well. It'll be a hybrid program. We'll have people in our office, Midtown, uh, and be on uh, Zoom as well. Also, so. it was nice to hear uh, Dr. Post mention Norman Relkin. Mm -hmm. I went to high school with Norman Relkin. Oh, really? Yes, yeah. yes. So when I heard his I'm name, I'm not sure I mean, where Dr. Relkin is at the moment. So I yeah. think I looked him actually looked him up not long ago. I think he's with some either kind of company that's working on care that's based somewhere out. I don't know in the southwest, but yeah, he was a high school classmate of mine. We graduated the same yeah. year. A very distinguished neurologist and researcher. I know. Right yeah. <laughs> so um, let me remind you um, that. Uh, that the, you know, the, the book that Dr. Post wrote is available, you know, anywhere, Amazon, anywhere you, you buy books or any bookstore. Um, and uh, although I like Kindle and I, uh, but I love actually having a real, you know, hard copy book in my hands to read and go back to. So, um, and something like this, I think can be very, you know, I recommend getting it in a hard copy. And uh, hello, Kitty. Uh, see, it brings pleasure. Animals absolutely bring pleasure. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, not at all. It's, it's not wanted my attention. <laughs> I, I get it. Um, so I think, um, let me uh, also remind you that we have the walk coming up on October 23rd in Central Park, and you're all welcome to join us and to participate. I encourage you to do that. Uh, by going to caringkindnyc.org slash walk and sign up if you're not already signed up. You can create a team. And as I said, you can bring, you know, dogs, uh, uh, cats too, if they're, <laughs> if they're amenable. Mine usually are not. Uh, and um, so let me think. I think there's one other question here. Yes, exactly. So Francis writes, what can be done to reduce the likelihood of dementia also sounds like what can be done to reduce heart disease, diabetes, et cetera. So, you know, we're, the system is one system and the brain uses blood that comes from, you know, the heart, which is, uh, and so if there's something wrong with the cardiovascular system, there'll be something wrong with the cerebral vascular system, which will affect how we think. And so very much there is this interconnectedness. Um, and there's a lot of studies that are showing the relationship between um, diabetes and dementia, especially uncontrolled diabetes. And there's some fascinating work that's very preliminary now that's looking at some diabetes drugs that might um, reduce the risk of dementia. Um, so you know, there, there's, a, there's a lot of interesting work going on up there. Um, I 
thank you all for attending and for your attention. Um, so have a good evening and uh, hope to see you at the walk. If you do, come up and say hello and uh, I will certainly be there. And thank you everybody. Okay, bye.